is what we're going to cover today. We're going to talk about strategies that the vendors that we cover across the entire technology space, what they're doing with respect to Gen AI. We're going to talk about alliances and how critical the ecosystem play is. And then we're going to talk about specific vendors in specific categories and what they're doing. And across all of these three areas, we're going to be tying in generative AI use cases, specific examples of where we think uh, the market is headed. So who are, who's talking to you today? It's myself and Boz. Um, uh, yeah, I'm the, uh, the more handsome guy on the left. Um, so I just want to put it out here at the start. So technology business research, we look at the strategies, the financial performance, the go-to-market, uh, everything around individual companies. We're, we take individual companies and we understand what's driving them, how they're making their money, where they're heading in the future. So even when we tackle a, a topic like generative AI, when we're looking at as broad and, and as market changing a, a technology as it is, we're still looking at it from the perspective of what are the companies doing? How are they deploying it internally? How are they bringing it to market to their clients? What is the difference that Gen AI is going to make in their business model, in their revenues, in their strategies going forward. So just wanted to make sure we set the stage. That's how we're coming at this big topic. And so we'll start off first with the strategies. And basically it's it's about, it's about people, it's about the training, uh, it's about what we call customer zero. And then it's making generative AI part of the bigger technology picture. It's not just a, a standalone uh, solution that you're selling. It fits within all the other technology that enterprises have been buying over the last decades. And one thing I want to stress when we talk about strategies, and we wrote this in our generative AI and artificial intelligence market landscape last December, is that really there's not a great deal of difference in the strategies that the companies that we're looking at have deployed, or I should say there wasn't in 2023. That's beginning to change in 2024. So the difference couldn't be, you couldn't make a difference as a company in the generative AI space by having a different strategy. It really was about the storytelling. It was who could who could capture uh, attention, who could capture their clients' attention um, with the best story around Gen AI, not necessarily a strategy. But again, that was 2023, changing as we move into 2024. So we did see in 2023 just a nonstop barrage of announcements about a billion dollars here, two billion dollars there, three billion dollars there, uh, and a lot of it around training and, and intellectual property, but. To focus on the training part for a minute, um, the training really is something that we see as, as an, a chance to build credibility, uh, to imply to your clients and to your ecosystem partners that you will have people available that understand and can deploy generative AI solutions, and you will also have them at scale. Um, and, it, and importantly too, training is expected. It's what employees believe is gonna be part of their careers going forward, so they expect that their employers are going to help them get trained up on it to, to develop professionally in that way. Um, and then, of course, critically, and, and we'll we'll go into this in, in greater detail throughout the, the rest of this presentation, it's training on your partner's technologies. It's not just training on um, what you do well and what you're bringing to the market, but how that fits in with your ecosystem uh, partners. So this webinar, starting right now, is going to be a little different than other webinars. Usually it's a back and forth. Today it's going to be me giving you what we think and Boz giving you what we really think, the color commentary on top of what I've been saying. So Boz, talk about training. Uh, yeah, so from a training perspective, uh, kind of taking a little giant step back, not just for Gen AI, but looking at the broader market trends, what we are seeing from a vendor's approach and vendor's resource management strategies. Well, in the last uh, 12 months, 12 to 15 months, has been the, the ongoing need for recalibration. Uh, of the staffing pyramids of the vendors and how they think about what may be coming their way in terms of the opportunities, but also the threats to their business models and how they, they should be planning for the staffing, uh, their benches and skilling their benches. So the broader trend has been around um, layoffs, um, decreasing headcount growth, uh, not so, you know, just something that the vendors are um, forced to do largely because the demand for the services that they usually provide to the buyers um, has slowed down from the peak on 2021 and 2022. And it's really about that recalibration and thinking about how many more people would I need? What is the type of skills I'm going to need as Gen AI starts to scale deployment? So there's the the notion in the market that Gen AI is forcing a lot of those layoffs. And it's when we look at the broader statistics, uh, what we have seen in recent uh, months has been around 
about 80% of the layoffs in the tech sector have been largely because of slowdown demand, and only about 20% have been accounted for a direct correlation with Gen AI. Would that trend change? Likely, but it won't be an overnight sensation. So it's something to, as vendors think about recalibration, is about accounting that, again, they still need to have enough people to secure the base, to support the uh, ongoing outsourcing engagement, transformation engagements, but they also need to continue to um, upskill and reskill. And, and there's a new initiative, as Patrick mentioned on the opening of the slide. There's a lot of focus on that reskilling and, and, and upskilling going on right now. So the whole notion of crowdsourcing, um, I think, will be uh, even greater uh, of importance as we're thinking about uh, where the skills are, what types of skills are needed as vendors uh, take the next level um, of opportunity for Gen AI. So in addition to training, uh, I mentioned customer zero. So this is this idea of some people say, you know, we drink our own champagne or, or we eat our own dog food, depending on how you want to put it. It's basically the idea that a lot of the companies that we cover first deploy their own, their own IP, their own solutions internally, test it out internally, develop it internally, test it out internally, uh, before then rolling it out to their clients, their customers. So they are themselves customer zero. In generative AI, this is critical. Um, it's important in a lot of different solutions, but really, or technologies, but certainly critical in terms of Gen AI because being customer zero provides that immediate credibility. Uh, it's it's more tangible. You're not talking about use cases that are at a pilot stage that might go to scale. You're not talking about use cases that are an idea. You're talking about being able to actually deploy something internally uh, and then turn around and, and bring it to your clients and know, know that it already works. A real critical understanding that we came to during the course of our research last year was about how much clients are looking for use cases that are tiered. They're looking for those easy, relatively easy use cases, um, things in, in marketing, things in sales enablement, um, things in knowledge management, stuff that can be done quickly and has a minimal impact or at least a minimal risk on a, on a company's uh, operations, uh, but can turn around and, and give you a quick or quick return on that investment. Then there are those middle tier use cases, which are more about enterprise wide uh, solutions or enterprise wide data sets or enterprise wide um, software. And, and even I suppose you could even get enterprise wide services. In any case, it's things that cut across the entire enterprise. That's sort of the, and now think about like SAP or Salesforce or those large enterprise wide programs. Um, that's the second tier. And then the third tier is sort of, you know, what, what's coming way down the line and from generative AI, the, the idea that you can talk to your you can talk to your enterprise and it talks back to you. Um, so that's that idea of tiers is important because what we've seen is that the use cases that are are starting at customer zero, that is that the use cases that are rolled out from having been developed and deployed internally, um, but then also recognize these different tiers, those are the use cases that resonate the most. Boz? Yeah, I think um, just to, uh, again, looking at the broader market from a digital transformation, how a Gen AI story fits in it and from a use case perspective, um, the use cases are largely shaped by the client maturity in terms of how far they are in the digital transformation process. And that's, that's the position most of the buyers come from because uh, there's, they're over the, the spectrum in terms of, you know, some of them are further along, you know, from their data strategy and thinking about exactly what needs to happen with, um, you know, their Gen AI models. But there's others, there's a, quite a bit of buyers they are still in the initial phase of trying to migrate to cloud and thinking about what the cloud data looks like and how they sh how it should be applied, you know, for the next wave of Gen AI models are built. So, um, if I have to draw a direct comparison from, as Patrick mentioned, the use cases, the client maturity shapes them all. Most often, than not right now the conversation. So that low hanging fruit around the customer experience, the front office, um, you know, easier um, kind of a, a application, so to speak, where. There's a less of a, a risk on the enterprise data, and the data that is being used is for developing, impacting direct sales, sales automation, and, and things in that nature. So that's a that's a that's a almost like falls back to what Patrick said in, in the beginning, meaning uh, buyers and the market and the vendors are very much falling into the what they know best, and the strategies that they apply are very much in line with that. Okay, we know how we did our digital transformation programs. And just know how they approach those opportunities, and that kind of follows that pattern. There's certain nuance there that many are discounting and uh, are actually not accounting for is the implications of the end consumer. Uh, but I think it's something that uh, will separate the, the 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 vendors thinking about end consumer as they think about those use cases from the one that they're not. So to go off script for a little bit, boss. Um, 
when we looked at digital transformation going back 10 years, yeah. um, we saw that it was the, not the retail, but the customer experience that yeah. was sort of the initial driving force around digital transformation. Is it, is that, are you saying, seeing something similar in Gen AI? Very much. I mean, customer experience, uh, content development, sales automation, this is, this is kind of the, the use cases we keep hearing because the, the, the proof of concept, so to speak, I couldn't say, I mean, the use cases to the point of like, yes, we can show a kind of more immediate ROI, the productivity improvement from an employee experience perspective, that's another piece, but the broader organizational impact from IT operations, back office systems, uh, we're not there yet. Fair enough, so the last strategy is, is about bringing, bringing generative AI to clients explicitly as part of what they've already invested in. Uh, that generative AI is not um, not a, a brand new technology that you need to spend a lot of new money on, but it's something that is complementary to blockchain, supply chain, 5G, Edge, SAP, everything that clients have been investing in, all of the, the technologies, all the emerging technologies uh, around digital transformation. Gen AI is a, a, a not a layer on top of that, but it's something that can pull all those things together. And by presenting use cases in that way, by saying that what we're bringing um, has that much higher expectation around a return on investment because we're already leveraging the, the technology that you have in place. That's that's incredibly critical. And, and I would say one other point to that is that as we learned over the course of 2023, just because you slap Gen AI as a label on something does not mean it's actually going to sell. Boss. Yeah, I think and again from a digital transformation perspective and where buyers are, there's the um, exhaustion, uh, client exhaustion from a kind of a, a digital fatigue, so to speak. So the important piece here is you're thinking about the IT systems and all the other technologies that vendors have been trying to sell, buyers have been trying to buy and implement over the last 10 years. Uh, the important piece when it comes to Gen AI is that for vendors specifically is not to treat uh, Gen AI as yet another SaaS solution and trying to become a plug and play. I mean, there's be great opportunities for doing that along the way with API connectors and everything that may come along the way with industry specific large language modes or geo specific large language modes, you name it down the road. But at this stage of the game, it's thinking about from a position of like what those models do and how the data has been organized. Every enterprise data is unique when it's kept within the boundaries of the firm. So, you know, need to think about for, for that lens of the uniqueness of the enterprise data, understanding that you can't just come and say, we have a Gen AI kind of a solution for you now. It's a little bit different approach. So that's the big nuance of how other technologies have been sold, uh, packaged and, and, and delivered in the past versus how those models need to be organized. Um, again, to my comment earlier, thinking about the end consumer, it's important, it's ever important here because how you organize that data, how you develop that data uh, will be even, you know, have a greater impact on how actually those enterprises uh, interact and communicate and deliver their services to the end consumers as well. Excellent, and we're going to get to a data story in a little bit too. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to add in here, just some of the research that we've done, and this comes from our voice of the customer research that published uh, last December, I believe. Um, and you can see the survey results here. The, the one that jumped out at me when we were looking at this was the center uh, graph there about the use cases and how the percentages for what is Gen AI best suited for, the percentages are not all that different uh, across these different areas from things like, you know, as, as different as fraud detection and content creation, as different as, you know, procurement uh, and software development. So if those percentages are all similar, what it says to me is that um, the use case that is best, that Gen AI is best suited for depends entirely on, on the client. Uh, it depends on entirely on what the client's business problem is that they're trying to solve. Um, and and I'm, I'm not going to steal boss's thunder on this, uh, but I think it's really important because we're frequently asked, uh, what is the uh, what is the, the most resonant Gen AI use case? What is selling the most? What are people looking for? That question comes up again and again. And the, the answer, unfortunately, from us is always almost just the same. It, it depends on what the client is actually looking for. The Gen AI, the best use case for Gen AI within any environment, within any enterprise, is going to be the one that quickly shows a return on investment and solves a problem. What that problem is depends entirely on what the client is, Boz. Yeah, and just looking at the graphs here from where and how budgets are being distributed as well as where the spending is going to occur uh, in the next 12 to 24 months, uh, the biggest expectation for the buyers, to Patrick's point, is 
understanding and the readiness from the vendor side of uh, ability to integrate and implement GNI services and solutions essentially with existing IT infrastructure. So that having the um, IT knowledge is, is critical. Uh, again, boils down to the data uh, comment we made a moment ago. Certainly pr presents an opening for vendors that have um, a strong systems integration capabilities, um, strong engineering background as well, not surprised there. but. Um, again, buyers uh, that are further along the way for more mature are really about um, hey, make sure this is not you know messing things up in my current environment. But so bring up your best talent, your skilled resources, because this is where the um, most of the money will be spent is the integration and implementation. Because the complexity was already there on the existing IT systems, and the Gen AI will create even greater complexities. Yeah. Excellent. So that was the strategies. Now we're going to move to the the alliances, the ecosystem part of this story. Um, and as you see in the headline here, that end to end has ended. Um, so everybody needs everybody needs help. So we're going to cover sort of the the credibility that comes through working in your ecosystem, the the range uh, of vendors that are in this Gen AI ecosystem, and then and then the criticality of data to all of this, of course. Um, so when we when we think about where we were a year ago um, to where we are now, there's, there really has been a shift in the buyer mentality around generative AI, in particular, a shift in who they want to be buying from. Uh, initially, you know, this time last year, uh, the only people selling Gen AI uh, to a client were the people that were already at the client. Uh, if you weren't a trusted vendor, if you weren't a trusted advisor, you certainly weren't going to be selling this, this um, emerging brand new super hyped technology. Uh, but but that has changed, and I think what's really critical to understand now is that the way that vendors can accelerate uh, their credibility really is primarily, I'm going to go, it's, it's, it's entirely through their ecosystem. You, you can roll out all the marketing hype you want. Um, you can say you've got all these different skills and capabilities, but really it, it is, and we'll come back to this in a few minutes, it really is um, about the ecosystem and the credibility that's built by being, uh, by leaning into and leaning on your uh, ecosystem partners, Boz? Yeah, I think that ecosystem is important because again, the, the way the buyers think about it, again, it, we I mentioned more earlier in the presentation how the market is evolving and there is the you know notion and the, the processes that currently buyers are going through, looking through vendor consolidation. They're looking to optimize their um, existing digital stacks. So I think it's, it's, it's because again, they were just, they just overbought and they were oversold in the last uh, 24, 36 months. So understanding and, and coming from a position of like a partner positions to uh, rather than upselling uh, is what resonates with buyers essentially because they appreciate that, separa that separation of labor essentially. And it's important, it's even critical in, in today's market and how buyers procure services to you know, see that vendors that they work with are better partners than better sellers, essentially. Yeah. Um, so let's continue building on this this alliances thing. Um, we have seen the alliances, the ecosystem around technology uh, and alliances uh, and partnerships have really been evolving. They they started to change a lot pre-pandemic, and then there was a lot of change and disrupt in, disruption post-pandemic. Um, but then generative AI has kind of really accelerated all this. And then I'm sort of making this point again, but we think it's really critically important. Um, what matters in the ecosystem is really how your partners, how your ecosystem partners describe you. We talk a lot about differentiation and we could have an entire webinar why I don't think differentiation is important. What really is critically important is how your partners actually talk about you. And when it comes to generative AI, uh, uh, that's again, has been super overhyped uh, and lots of claims about different use cases and, and taking things to scale when your ecosystem partner can actually credibly back up those claims or can tell your clients how you're contributing to their solution. There's there's the best answer right there, Boz. Yeah, I think it boils down to a lot about uh, leadership alignment, a lot of training, a lot of co-investments, a lot of building trust. Uh, and that's gonna, you know, it does takes a, a little bit more than just uh, signing on a dotted line between the two parties or three parties for that matter when it comes to the ecosystem management. So um, it requires a culture um, and instilling a different approach. It requires different incentive models, uh, a change, uh, you know, from the sales perspective, the training and just buying into that partner portfolio is much harder sometimes than, you know, buying, you know, it's, it's, it's also as it's, it's hard as could be like getting the internal buy-in, I guess. That's kind of the message here. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. So um, have you heard the saying, data is the new oil? Yeah. Um, I guess we've been hearing that for a decade. So when we talk about um, use cases around Gen AI, we we're, we're usually mean uh, the use cases within enterprises, within within clients. And we you know we, we certainly do talk about that uh, quite often, but it's, it's from our perspective as well, an important use case is how the vendors that we cover, the companies that we cover across the technology ecosystem are actually going to make money around Gen AI, what's their use case? Um, not not what are the use cases they're using internally and rolling out to clients, but how much is Gen AI gonna, gonna matter? And we think one of the most important areas, because again, this it's data, so it's all gonna come back to data. Um, no matter how good your data is, is, depends on how good, how what kind of results you're gonna get out of any kind of uh, generative AI solution. Um, and when we talk about data, we have to talk about governance, risk, and compliance. Um, and obviously governance, risk, and compliance is somewhere that the big four firms, uh, well-established, they certainly have had a, a lock on a certain um, percentage of that market for a long time. We think there's a lot of opportunity for smaller uh, smaller firms, smaller consultancies that have uh, governance, risk, and compliance capabilities, you know, on Alex Partners, Alvarez and Marcel. Uh, in the federal sector, of course, is Booz Allen Hamilton, although they're increasingly getting into the commercial side again. Um, CDW and Software One, I think, are, are examples of value-added resellers that have a GRC play as well, um, as I as I note on here, you know, potential Trojan horse. Um, and as I also wrote on here, you know, it's boring. Um, GRC is not the most exciting thing, but um, when it comes to the generative AI revenues that can be that can be um, earned by the big four firms, and so we're talking big four, we mean Deloitte, EY, PwC, and KPMG. Um, you know, that that's a long tail of revenues coming for them. Pause. Yeah, I think uh, when it comes to the the GRC governance and compliance, I think one key component here is to think about model governance as well, as we're talking about um, uh, Gen AI essentially, right? So the GRC is important on the business side. Uh, it's the business implication, the Gen AI will impact the business function of, of those enterprises. But while the GRC is a strong component of the big four and some of the smaller you know, uh, consulting firms that you mentioned, um, and there's an opening for uh, com companies that come more from the engineering background, essentially, when you're talking about understanding the model governance and talking about, you know, the, the slow vendors, you know, with the India-based heritage or some of the more like the, the Atos of the world and, and Accenture. I mean, they do have that a lot of that engineering uh, positioning and understanding how, how the model governance needs to work, essentially. So there's a lot of that thinking of cal recalibration of like GRC is, is important, but there's another, another dimension to governance this time around when it comes to Gen AI. Yeah, absolutely. So just want to take a quick time out here to note that we have been getting some questions in the queue, uh, in the Q&A, please keep putting them in there. A couple of these questions are fantastic and, and we will definitely dive into them at the end. And while it looks like we're just barely over halfway through, we're actually quite a ways through now. So we'll have plenty of time at the end for, for Q&A. So Boz, this particular slide, is it going to come up? There we go. Um, again, more research from our uh, voice of the customer. You want to touch on some yeah, of this? Yeah, uh, sure. I mean, we we spoke about some of those uh, findings, so to speak. We kind of uh, hinted towards those as we were discussing in the previous slides. But uh, so on the first one on the left, we, so when we were talking to enterprise buyers, uh, we asked them, "What do you think is going to be the impact on your staffing plans, right, for Gen AI adoption?" Interestingly enough, the the most uh, traction where we saw the most incident rates was where buyers are planning to increase their current staffing, um, you know, and trying to reduce uh, a reliance on uh, on third party services providers, which to us was really an early indication. Again, as Patrick mentioned earlier, uh, this is a lot of that research has happened in 2023. By we are in February 15 right now, things are evolving mm -hmm. very quickly. So we likely did this graph if we're under survey by middle of the year, we might have some different results. but. Point being is that the way we interpret that data point was uh, buyers are understood that there's a greater need for securing uh, the skilled talent in house because they just, you know, for a couple of reasons. One is, you know, uh, security, right? Securing security uh, because that's the data that needs to be managed in those models. It would be, you know, understanding that IT complexity is key. And two, they want to make sure they can manage that cost long term as well because that over-reliance on third-party services providers can some, sometimes backfire, especially um, you know, the, if, if the delivery is not executed up to the standards, up to the quality that the, that the vendors are promising from, from the beginning. It's such a new area that is more about control 
than anything else initially. Um, the second one in the middle, uh, again, putting a little bit more pressure um, on the vendor side, and I kind of alluded into towards that earlier as we're talking about the vendor consolidation and how and where uh, buyers are looking to come up with the money to pay for Gen AI, essentially, right? Um, so they are, uh, majority of the buyers, again, exploring multiple options or combination, but the one that uh, got the most attention was looking to uh, gain some savings and ask their existing services providers to generate some savings that they can then carve out and pay for those new initiatives. Again, some buyers are dedicating new budgets, but majority are looking to try to optimize that optimization we talked about to start to spend a little bit more on and test the, the Gen AI solutions. And last but not least, the graph on the right uh, is a really, um, there's like a, a tale of two cities here. On the top, the most critical component, two of the most critical components is understanding the industry needs uh, and having the Gen, Gen AI capabilities. But if you look towards the bottom, the most important one uh, uh, attribute is how well vendors are able to manage and utilize their partner ecosystem. So while the most critical is about knowing the, the industry and the business, the most important one is about getting your partners to work well together. So those two paired up uh, as what basically the, the, the part of the story we're trying to tell today. Yeah, excellent. And um, so I'm going to take my second time out now and just know that if you're not seeing these slides updating, just refresh and you should be able to get them. Um, you should be able to get back in sync with us. Um, and then also this, you'll be able to access this entire deck um, and the, the recording afterwards, so you can always hear it. And again, we're getting some great questions in. Uh, we will get to them. Um, oh, and one other thing in my third piece of my little time out here, um, I want to highlight something Boz said about how today is February 15th. What we think now is is what we think right now, um, and we're we are, we have seen our our research has led us to change our analysis around generative AI again and again and again over the course of 2023 and even early into this year. Uh, we think differently now than we thought on January 15th, and we're probably going to think differently on March 15th. So um, I guess stick with us. Uh, so all right, the last group of things that we wanted to talk about was um, get into some specific vendors. Uh, who exactly is going to be winning um, and who's going to be growing most in, in this coming year. And you can see some of the names on here and we'll go into them. So um, there we go. Uh, so the big four firms, uh, again, Deloitte, KPMG, PwC, and EY, um, clearly in a great position to leverage uh, their capabilities on, around governance, risk, and compliance. A question came in about security. Uh, you know, we would put that in that risk Part of that, um, and the, the big four firms have built considerable cybersecurity risk practices over the years um, and have been for a long time. It's, it's not a recent thing for them. They're certainly in a, in a great position based on uh, who their key personas are within the clients, uh, based on the, the breadth of services that they bring. We do think, and I mentioned a few companies earlier, um, we do think that the, the smaller consultancies um, are definitely going to be best positioned to serve their, their mid-market clients and probably others too and, and expand more uh, into the, the larger enterprise space because the demand for governance risk and compliance services around generative AI is, is going to accelerate and it's, it's not going to stop. It, you know, it, all, it all comes back to the data and you absolutely have to have it. And, and we can go down all kinds of different um, tangents about the importance of regulations uh, when we think of it by industry, importance of regulations when we think of it by country, um, how the different uh, uh, data centers and uh, infrastructure providers and cloud providers are handling those challenges. All of it though is going to end up funneling back to the, the big four firms uh, and their, their very similar peers across the, the consulting space. Um, and so Boz, comment on that or tell me which one of the big four you think is, is really standing out right now. Uh, well, I think each of the big four we cover again, this is uh, Deloitte, uh, KPMG, PwC, and EY, um, you know, they all come from the, their position of strength, uh, I would say. Um, Deloitte has uh, well-established probably the most mature presence when it comes to the IT play overall. And they do have a, a fairly well-established and mature analytics practice. Mm -hmm. We've been tracking them as part of our analytics and insights benchmark for years now, and they are... Uh, Frequent number two in terms of revenue, um, kind of trailing, uh, well, I should say frequent number three because they are after Accenture and IBM. Yeah, IBM, uh, yeah right. and IBM, yes. Yeah. So, uh, but there's definitely getting more competition from the likes of EY and PwC and KPMG when it comes to the revenue size and the positioning. Now, when we, when we start looking a little bit broadly and thinking about Gen AI, 
Uh, you can argue that EY's play with EY Fabric a few years back, thinking about how that interconnectivity needs to happen around different systems and how data is being managed, may put them in the forefront. But again, there's a, what they have in terms of solution portfolio, relationship with IT buyer, partnership ecosystem. So those pieces all play together. It's not just one piece of that portfolio. Again, uh, KPMG is certainly uh, really closing the gap with when it comes to IT, thinking about their analytics story is really, really strong. So we heard really great some use cases from KPMG uh, and, and their part and their clients uh, in recent conversations and thinking about how that actually paves the way for a better, more a robust um, uh, GIS story as well with them. And, you, and PwC, you know, they've been uh, probably the most active when it comes to bringing more of a holistic portfolio, including their tax practice. So yeah. everyone comes from a, a slightly similar, slightly different angle, essentially, yeah. when it comes to GIS. And I think uh, content creation has always been one of the early Gen AI use cases. And I think the, the use case I've described more than any other is one that was shared uh, with us by PwC. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, I would have to say they, they, they've, in their own way, they've sort of been um, ahead on a lot of this. So, all right, that's that's the uh, that group of firms. Um, let's talk about the, the India-centric vendors, uh, the India-centric, the IPPs as they're called, um, and what it is that they're bringing to the table and what might change now. I was making a joke with the fries, you know, because we're going to talk about chips uh, in a minute with Infosys. Um, and, and it just sort of made me laugh when I was putting it together. But it actually reflects sort of the transactional nature that a lot of the India Central players have had. Um, and and they've, they've built phenomenal businesses um, by doing it. But I think one thing that Gen AI does is positions them really well to begin to change, to be able to play to some of their strengths, to be able to use the insight that they have in their in their enterprise clients IT architectures to see where a lot of the problems are. Managed services is in many ways uh, a great window into what's working and not working within an enterprise. So the the India centric players have a have a phenomenal opportunity in front of them to be able to leverage the strengths they have, the knowledge they have about the, the clients that they're serving, um, and apply generative AI as a way of accelerating change within those enterprises and as and as a way of changing the way that the India centric players are perceived in the market, boss? Yeah, I think you have a question there. Why is Infosys acquiring chip design consulting capabilities? I think uh, something that maybe may, you may or may not be aware, they made an announcement on acquisition just as they were closed about a thousand people uh, out of India. It's a semiconductor design services company. So um, just thinking about what Patrick described, how it's called InSemi. Um, and it's um, trying to Pair it back to what Infosys does well, services delivery, right? That's their, that's their bread and butter supply. So, so they're really delivering on that supply side, right? They're not pushing that envelope on the consulting side as much as before, right? So, but if you're thinking about why they will be acquiring semiconductor design services and what Infosys does and how it fits in that transactional mindset, essentially is that adding those services certainly bolsters that value proposition, especially as buyers are trying to assess and you know, how to think about price attractive CPU or premium price GPU uh, data centers. So Infosys has always been strong on that price play, essentially from the low cost perspective. So having those semiconductor engineers on their bench can help them uh, supporting those CPU, CPU around models, uh, again, down, down the line. So kind of like a building uh, a, a bench uh, for the forward looking opportunity, essentially, appealing to more of those uh, price sensitive uh, buyers. Again, Infosys is also uh, skilling about 50,000 people in NVIDIA technology. So they're not just doing the CPU price play, but they're trying to cover the GPU uh, ground as well. Again, Infosys is not the only one that's invested in semiconductor design services. You know, we've heard it from the Accenture, uh, from, we've heard it from Capgemini, we've heard it from uh, HCL, from Wipro. But this is kind of where we're seeing the next wave of having a uh, skilled bench, going back to the town discussion earlier, that uh, these are particular skills that we're seeing vendors invest in. Yeah, and I think if we had looked back, uh, I mean, we've, been kind of, we've been covering these companies for, for forever. And I think if we had looked back even just a year and a half ago, if you had said we were going to talk about Infosys acquiring chip design consulting capabilities, we would have, we would have just laughed. It wouldn't make any sense at all. Um, okay, and then the last group of vendors we want to talk about really is is um, are the, the hyperscalers. And I want to make you can read what's on the slide here. I want to make two important points, important to me at least. Um, why EY's strategic decision around Microsoft predated Gen AI? What do we mean by that? Um, for reasons that had nothing to do with uh, picking. Oh, well, they had everything I should say to do with what they, who they can and can't partner with. Um, EY uh, made a strategic decision to partner uh, very explicitly with Microsoft to uh, dedicate the uh, cloud professional services 
practice uh, just around Azure um, to be able to tell their people you're you know you're not going to be cloud architects across three different uh, cloud environments. You're just going to be an Azure person. All of that um, really cemented EY's relationship with Microsoft and uh, and accelerated the work that they were doing together. All of that predated Gen AI. Clearly, it makes a big difference when we think about, and that's what this headline is about. When you think about the hyperscalers and their growth, and even if it has slowed in, in recent um, months and years, uh, they're still such an important player in the market that being able to leverage every, you know, to, to get every ounce of juice as you can out of that relationship um, is really critically important. I think another thing that we we heard in last summer, and, and now it feels so dated when I even say it this way, um, but we heard about clients doing their initial generative AI pilot projects on the cloud, you know, running them in their, in their cloud environments that they already had. But then when it came time to scale, moving those, those projects uh, on premise, and the idea being that it's just too expensive to continue doing it on the cloud. Um, we knew then, even as we heard that, that the hyperscalers were not going to sit back and just say, oh, all right, well, let's, let's just let all those workloads go back on prem. Not going to happen, didn't happen. And so that's, I think, what you see here about what's going on with, with uh, with AWS and Google and Microsoft, um, boss. Yeah, one more piece here when it comes to the how uh, hyperscalers we think are to react or starting to react uh, to potential threats of uh, where a lot of their screen demeanor, as we like to call it, you know, uh, revenue opportunities come from, is the notion of trying to democratize access to Gen AI tools, the lesser need for developing, um, you know, for the need of higher skilled talent, uh, and really uh, providing a little bit more like a easier access, that's the big part of it, right? And it's, to us, that's a little bit of a, uh, especially from the likes of the GCP and, and Amazon, to us, especially for someone like Amazon, um, they, it's almost like a protecting the turf against the potential revenue, uh, 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 not only cannibalization, but winning a wallet share from mm -hmm. uh, from Microsoft and the whole co-pilot play, right, on, on one end. But on the other side, it's a little bit of a playing with a fire because if their SI partners have less um, model, custom model development and custom model integration opportunities, that's not going to go well with them. So it's a that democratization calls for a lesser need of custom model development, which is certainly goes up against what the SI partners are making their money on. So it's a it's a battle, uh, and it's just getting started, I would say. And everyone's trying to think about. Uh, short-term and long-term place, and those, some of those long-term place, uh, placing those bets today may turn around and backfire, if they're not, <laughs> if they're not played properly and measured properly, I guess, yeah. So Boz made that point yesterday to a client. He used a very much more colorful phrase when he said that though, so we'll we'll uh, we'll keep this keep this webinar clean. All right, we're into the Q&A, um, so I want to tackle a few questions that are, that are easy, and then we'll tackle the hard questions. Um, one question came in, uh, what AI use cases can be for traditional data centers on 5G core and OSS BSS segmentation separately? I love this question because I cannot answer it, but I know exactly who can. Uh, at TBR, we have an infrastructure practice and we also have a telecoms practice. So depending on which way you want to go at that, from the data center view or from the telecom view, um, you can reach out to us uh, here separately whenever um, and ask us for the two people. It's, it's Angela Lambert and, um, and Chris Antlitz are the two people that you want to talk to at TBR. So I don't know the answer to that, but I know that we have the answer to that. Um, another one that came in that I think is a fantastic question. Does demand for business advisory typically come before IT advisory for Gen AI use cases assessment, or do they occur in parallel? Boz and I might disagree on this, so I'll go first. Um, what I think is fascinating about Gen AI is how much the uh, the hype, the demand, the attention, um, the actual knowledge, the experience using the tools has been across the entire enterprise. It's not been just led from top down, nor is it uh, sort of, um, initially we did describe Gen AI as like a bring your own device on steroids. It's not that either. It's coming from all directions. And as a result of that, typically you think of business advisory being that first decision that's made at a senior level, this is what our strategy is going to be. This is where we need to be going. And then you say, okay, what you know? Now we need. Now we move to IT advisory for what are the technology tools that we're going to need in order to be able to implement, in order to be able to accelerate our strategy. Um, that's all happening all at once, and that's all happening all at once with respect to generative AI because the demand, the interest, the hype, the experience with the playing around with the tools is happening across the entire enterprise, from C-suite down to the, the shop floor. 
Yeah, surprisingly, you probably not going to disagree this time yeah, around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I, I think it's also, again, that it, it depends, comes to mind, because it depends on how far uh, enterprises are on their maturity in terms of the digital transformation. So if there's an enterprise that's a little bit further along in their data strategy story, uh, the, uh, you know, drives uh, one set of services versus another one that takes an extra step or two before they can get to uh, the Gen AI use case discussion. So there's a... Um, a blend again of services that uh, occur, but the, the the weight of each of the services components um, varies depending on how far along those buyers are. Right, and I don't think we're going to see McKinsey and Nvidia partnering, but you know they're they're yeah. they're both playing a super important role. Yeah, they are. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So another question came in: What is the supply chain or vendors slash resources to be considered in building a Gen AI solution? So a couple things come to mind when I think of that. Um, one is everyone who plays to their own strengths and plays to their partner's strengths uh, does better than those that try to be end to end. Um, we've, we've talked about the death of end to end, the end of end to end. Um, anytime that you're trying to put together an end to end solution, what you're basically saying is I'm putting limits on what I can actually do that and I'm, I'm stretching myself to those limits rather than saying I'm going to focus on my core and what I really do well. Um, now, again, I'm, uh, I'll jump up on the soapbox again, how your ecosystem partners talk about what you do is just as important to the market as how you talk about what you do, how well you are able to share with your ecosystem partners that knowledge of what makes you different, special, unique, great at what you're doing and how well they can then echo that back to their or, or um, say that back to your shared clients is so incredibly important. So if you if you take those sort of fundamentals as a starting place and then you say, what is the supply chain or the, the vendors and the resources that have to be considered in building a Gen AI solution, uh, it, it really depends on your starting place. If you're coming from a big four firm, yeah, you absolutely do need to make sure that you know who, uh, how the hyperscalers talk about you. You need to know, make sure you know how companies like Dell and HPE and Lenovo, how do they play in the Gen AI space and how well do they know what you're actually bringing to a Gen AI solution? Um, and then it goes all the way down. I don't know enough about chip manufacturing to know who the important players are there, but that's that's how I think about it is, is building that supply chain means really understanding how well you're doing what you're doing and how well your ecosystem partners are talking about how well you're doing what you're doing. Boss? I think you covered it. Yeah, all right. I'm doing that one, yeah. Um, good. Uh, let's jump to another one here and thank you. Oh, these are coming in like crazy. Um, another question, what uh, about AI solutions available is bare metal as a service, uh, bare metal cloud, given multiple GPU advantages. Again, I don't know. I don't think Boz knows. Nope. No. But we got a guy. Yeah, yeah, we got a guy. So um, we'll take that question and, and we'll pass it along to um, the folks in our firm that actually do understand that question, where it's coming from. Um, so let's see. Uh, trying to read through some of these. Um, a question came in. What are the key themes around security concerns? Uh, and generative AI. And then I'll, I'll pair that with another question that where many organizations are trying to adopt Gen AI, but the biggest concern should be security of your data. What have you seen on the security front of Gen AI conversations? Um, I think it's been, it was fascinating in the voice of the customer research to see analytics jump to the top of the list above security. Mm -hmm. And what's the other one that's always- Cloud. And so cloud. cloud cloud and security have ranked consistently number one and number two technology supporting buyers digital transformation initiatives for the last five plus years. No surprise there. Analytics, AI, not Gen AI, AI were in the three to five like uh, ranking, so to speak. And this last year, analytics jumped on the top and it's now that promise and the expectations have put you know pressure on, you know, okay, now get that data working and let's see all these analytics that have been invested for years now and in place to make sure they can set it up and from a security standpoint um i think the data the, the data security uh, when it comes to ai models is as, as, as critical as it can be we we've heard conversations and one particular use case come from mind uh, kpmg uh spun out uh, a startup called cranium uh out of their studio um about a year ago and in conversations with them and as well as with some of the buyers was the identification that there's really the data, um, the data science piece was something that was not addressed by many, many, many organizations. And that drove an opportunity for someone like KPMG to go after a market that actually was 
uh, at the dawn or the GNI, which is getting started. So security is top of mind, no question about it, but uh, there's an opening for a different type of security conversations when it comes to data science, uh, the data the, from a workflow perspective um, as the GNI models evolve. Yeah, and I think it's important too, like to think that, that you no, know, uh, this gets back to my point earlier about not slapping Gen AI on a solution and saying, hey, we can sell it. Um, that's even so maybe even more so true around security where where clients have already invested a certain amount in their cybersecurity, um, in their needs and meeting their cybersecurity needs. Um, and if you just come in and say, hey, we, you know, now we have a Gen AI enabled solution. I don't think you're helping them out. I don't think long-term that's going to be going to be a great play. Um, another question came in from the IT services provider. You talk about the need for developing use cases to success, first developing it internally and later on at scale with customers. What about some conversational AI platforms developed over Gen AI that already bring some use cases ready to use, such as contact centers, HR, procurement, and retail? Uh, I, th I think that actually, that's sort of reinforces our point that there are those first tier kind of low hanging fruit, relatively low risk um, Gen AI solutions that are readily deployable, but not credibly deployable absent for no one vendor can credibly deploy them absent having uh, either done them themselves or proven that they're partnering with the right kind of solution providers for that. So you, you can't just come to the market and say, hey, we, we have an HR solution uh, you know, a chatbot solution using generative AI that's great for HR. No, we're not using it internally for ourselves. I mean, if, if, if you're not, if you are not customer zero, especially for that easier stuff. And, and so uh, to talk about a, a good example of that, um, uh, PwC has their, uh, what's it called? Chat PwC? Yeah. I think it's chat PwC. So an internal knowledge management, knowledge sharing platform that um, is obviously Gen AI enabled. Um, and to be able to take that to their clients and say, look, this is how we do knowledge sharing. This is how we do knowledge um, uh, sales enablement through our own internal platform. It, it's, I'm sure it was really difficult for the people to put it together, uh, but now that they have it and they've proven it, they can take it out to the market. I think that that's the first tier stuff that's important. Yeah, I think also it depends on the, the size of the client, right? Mm -hmm. So mid-size, small to mid-size clients, maybe a little bit uh, more easier to buy into a pre-configured Gen AI array solution that is for a marketing or procurement or HR, so to speak. And, and uh, because the, the implication, the risk is much smaller than going with, you know, a 10,000 plus globally run organization. So there's, even though those globally run organizations may test solutions like that, in particular business units and particular geographies, um, it's uh, the risk is much greater uh, versus uh, small. We know that there's a, had a conversation, you know, with someone like you know, implementing um, well, a couple of occasions came up Air AI for marketing solutions and contact centers were brought up, you know, and we looked into that solution. It's a great solution for what 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 is built for, but the buyers that actually were using that solution were much smaller in size, and just they saw it as a really as a cost optimization tool. Actually. All right, we've got time for a few more questions here and a couple of them are going to be easy because I'm going to say the same thing I said before. You know, we got a guy. Um, so one of the questions, what are the big use cases for AI in the aerospace and defense slash space sector? Um, so again, I don't know, but we actually have within the, we actually have within my practice, so I should know maybe more. Um, uh, we have John Costas and James Wickard and they're, they are focused on the uh, federal IT services vendors. So they're looking at, um, the federal IT space from the perspective of, or, or tracking and following and understanding um, those vendors that are in that space. Obviously they do a lot of work on aerospace and defense. Um, so we, we could, we'll make sure that everybody can access um, their, their names and their research and reach out to them for some, some answers on that. Um, another question that came in, um, Oracle and NVIDIA, uh, they're partnering as well. Do you see them as relevant because of their data focus and their capabilities? Um, I'll say one quick thing on that, two quick things on that. Um, one, uh, and it ties back to what I said a moment ago about the federal space, we do look at Oracle, um, we look at Oracle in another practice, in the cloud and software practice looks at Oracle. Um, but we also look at them from the lens of how they're partnering uh, with the IT services vendors. So not the NVIDIA side, not going that direction, but we're going the other direction toward the IT services vendors. Um, so we're tracking them very closely. Um, and so again, we have a cloud and software practice that can talk more specifically about Oracle, but Boz, do you have thoughts on this one? I mean, 
it's all about data, as you said, yeah. in both Oracle and data. And NVIDIA is, you know, Oracle, Oracle is about data. That's the heritage, yeah. right? So making it work, making it, uh, I think it will be less about the technical aspects of uh, partnering with those two companies. Today. It's more about aligning to uh, that partner view of like, understanding what the other company can do for you and, and vice versa, rather than trying to be a competitor. So I think it's more about that leadership, sales alignment, incentives, uh, from a go-to-market perspective, less so about a particular portfolio or, or a technology aspect that may be uh, a hurdle along the way. Excellent. So again, we've got time for a couple more questions. Um, any legal pushback on wide deployment of generative AI tools for customer-facing functions? Boz, you want to go first on this? Legal push on wide deployments. Um, well, I think we, we mentioned the, the data regulations, you know, that we're starting to hear from the likes, you know, in the, in the EU and some other countries, you know, just uh, outside and yes there's always that cautious lawyers are there to cautious risk so there's definitely um you know being brought up but again i think that boils down to a little bit more on the industry layer so you have one set of industries more like the b2c industries they're a little bit more open and ready to to try out and to do some different experiments with gen ai solutions for uh, and customers versus more of the highly regulated industries like life science or healthcare or financial services or government for that matter a little bit slower and a little bit more uh, legal, uh, legal, essentially being uh, framed uh, uh, when it comes to developing those solutions. So um, I think it's that's that's where we're going to start seeing the development. We didn't talk about it today, but the next wave of thinking about domain-specific uh, large language models or small large language models that are industry aligned that are uh, within the guardrails of a particular uh, jurisdiction or a particular industry layer. So there's, there's what's to come because uh, if for Blockchain, the government was kind of waiting and see, you know, um, how much regulations they need to push and should it be part of or not. I think Gen AI is putting um, a fire on the of all folks' chairs. And, yeah. and I think uh, yeah. uh, regulatory bodies will be a little bit more urgent this time around uh, to, to act up and, and partner up, essentially, between commercial and, and, and government side. Yeah, Gen AI did not come into the ecosystem or come into the market um, into a completely version, nothing was happening market. It came in at a time when there was already a backlash um, against quote, big tech, um, but still, and, and there's a, that definitely one of the early concerns of one of the early stories about Gen AI was how it was going to replace people. Like yeah. Gen AI is just going to get rid of people. Well, immediately you're going to have re regulators, um, their alarm bells are going to go off. In, our, in our, our predictions for 2024, which we released in December, um, a growing, growing regulatory, a growing burden of regulation was one of the things that we're predicting for, for 2024. Yeah. That we we see the regulatory bodies being much more active, um, not only around Gen AI, but absolutely around Gen AI. And then, and then your other point, Paul, is we could probably do an entire um, webinar on small, large language models or small, large learning models, uh, however you want to put them, um, because I think that's where there's going to be a massive opportunity for a lot of the companies that we cover, um, and for a lot of enterprises to be able to actually get that return on investment more quickly, not by relying on um, a large language model that's just commercially available just off the shelf, not the chat GPT model, yeah. but more the internal, let's let's use our own internal data to develop a large learning model. Um, and then keeping it siloed in a small, again, we could do an entire, uh, session on that. So I think that's all we have time for. There's f five minutes left. We were we we're going to end it at uh, we we're going to end this at, at, after 30 minutes, but we, saw, we added 25 minutes onto this webinar. Anyway, thank you all very much. Um, I guess the one other thing I was going to show, um, if you're not familiar with TBR, um, we do have a couple slides here at the end just to explain who we are, who uses our research, um, what kind of reach we have within the market. Um, and then, of course, there is, uh, if you want to see the two of us in our, our more natural environment, uh, sitting in our studio here at, at TBR, this is the other stuff that we put out um, and the kind of ways that we serve our clients. So if you have any other questions, please feel free to reach out to us.